This is a Russian PT-76, the current Red Army amphibious tank. It is now the property of the United States. It was not given to us by the Russians, nor did we purchase it, nor did we capture it in battle. You could say that it was obtained, all 15 tons of it, through intelligence channels. Or you could say we stole it. Once upon a time, spying or espionage was a fairly straightforward game. But we have come a long way rather quickly from Mata Hari. There is something new in the science of spying. It's not just stealing military hardware and secret plans, but using tanks and plans and men to promote our policies around the world and sometimes to overthrow governments we don't like. Both sides in the Cold War do it, both sides deny it. In the spy business, the dagger is replacing the cloak. And that is what this program is about. Self-protection is a primary function of any organism. That is as true of the green grass as it is of continental nuclear powers. Since the beginning of man, tribes and clans and nations have spied on one another across the valleys, across the oceans, and now across the world. We watch for the electronic imprint of the enemy's bombers. We listen for the whine of his missiles. We send beautiful, sophisticated machines over his territory to monitor his coded talk, to tally his gantries, to make inventory of his weapons. The very air is full of information for the spies of today. Much of this for Americans begins and ends in this building located at Langley, Virginia. This is the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States government. Everybody knows it, although the sign on the gate reads Bureau of Public Roads. It might have been designed by Ian Fleming. Serried, secret cubicles, computers which translate Russian to English at 30,000 words an hour, documents burned in a $100,000 furnace. This is the Pentagon of the secret war. It is a depot for subversion and a kind of clandestine university. For many years, its scholarly headmaster was a super spy in the classic mold named Alan Dulles. Intelligence is nothing really other than information and knowledge. Uh, for the days of Socrates, by various methods, and even before that, uh, mankind has been seeking knowledge of everything that influences his own life or the life of the nation to which he belongs. Uh, but the idea that uh, it is necessarily nefarious, it's always engaged in overthrowing governments, that's false. That's for the birds. Now there are times, there are times uh, when the United States government feels that the developments in another government, such as in the Vietnam situation, is of a nature uh, to imperil the the safety and the security and the peace of the world and ask the Central Intelligence Agency to be its agent in that particular situation. Mr. Dulles, I know you've heard this many times, but there are people who say that we, with regard to the CIA, are waging a secret war with an invisible government. We are obviously engaged in many facets of what is generally called the Cold War, uh, which uh, the communist policy is forced upon us. No use denying that, that's, that's a fact of life. But may I say this, and I do it with all solemnity, at no time has the CIA engaged in any political activity or any intelligence activity that was not approved at the highest level. Whatever you say about it, the CIA has kept busy for the past 18 years. This is Laos in Southeast Asia, not so much a kingdom as a political playing field for the great powers. Some Laotian warriors are supplied by the Russians, some by the Americans. The United States supplies 100,000 tribesmen with rice and bullets through a sort of air CIA. Secret contracts with so-called private airlines. One is called Air America. In all, a fleet of 50 aircraft is involved, all flown by civilians who are often the target of communist gunfire. No. <laughs> 
We found two of the pilots in a Hong Kong bar, a New Zealander named Len Cowper and an American named Chuck Bade, reminiscing about their secret flights. So as we were flying along, I heard, uh, you know, pop, 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 and fighting into the aircraft. Yeah. And so I looked out the side there, and these, and the PLs were lined up there, about 15 or 20 on each side, at practically point-blank range. One of the boys quit the day after. He was a little bit green. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you knew down there, uh, mm. and how many guys were killed? Well, it was Serena and Campbell, uh, Chet Brown, Woody Baker, I'm oh, sorry, Woody Ford, um, Joe Riley. Good evening. Good evening. How are you tonight? Wonderful, thank you. Having a nice day? Just fine. Everything all right? Even better since you came. Thank you. And the winds of change swept across Guatemala. The pendulum swung very far left with the election in 1950 of Colonel Jacobo Arbenz as president. He confiscated the lands of the wealthy and filled his government with communists. He became, in local and American eyes, a menace. So the American government, through the CIA, made an alliance with Arbenz's opposition, and as of that moment, he was doomed. An American who had been air attaché at our embassy there, named Fred Sherwood, tells how the plot began. Uh, several of us thought that perhaps we could stop this movement by organizing something in the form of vigilantes or night riders. For example, uh, there was a group that tried to uh, bring in some Puerto Rican and Cuban gangsters who made an offer, a package deal to speak, to, uh, to kill or assassinate any 12 communists within the country for $50,000. We, uh, we went around trying to raise money, but uh, we were only successful in raising a part of this, and so this did never came off. But this demonstrates the desperate situation that was the country was in at that time. The American government threw in their forces with these small groups and helped organize these resistance groups to combat the communist force existing in Guatemala. This help was forthcoming in all sorts of technicians, pilots, demolition teams, radio technicians, professional psychologists who organize rumor networks. These men provided the, the know-how of organizing a successful revolution. It might have been designed by Ian Fleming.
You could say, we stole it. There is something new in the science of spying. It's not just stealing military hardware and secret plans, but using tanks and plans and men to promote our policies around the world and sometimes to overthrow governments we don't like. 